So Marlene, I want this to be as like unprofessional as possible. Not like inappropriate. And that no. not, kind of why we ask you, Marlene. Yeah. Oh, is it really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not, in, not unprof unprof unprofessional in that it's inappropriate. Just unprofessional, but oh, appropriate. I asked her because I thought it would be inappropriate. <laughs> okay, great. I will, you know, this is to sell books, right? After all. Yeah, exactly. So okay. it's, yes. It's, it's controversy. <laughs> okay, and, but and you're going to sell the books. Yeah. Anything to sell books. But you're going to start off, you're going to read, and then we're going to talk about, you know, yeah, but your, your story going, with it. We're literally going to read for about five minutes less. Okay, so then, and so the, then I'm the just... way we've done this, and, and we're, then we're going to have a nice conversation. I mean, you have been doing this work for so many years. And so, and we've known each other for so many years. And mm -hmm. so this is a great time for us to chat. Yeah, that's why By the way, I just guys, learned this, today how to pronounce your name. This, uh -huh. this is the show. Yeah. What do right you mean? This is the show. Yeah, this is happening more like It's this. happening right now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is Come it. on. Okay. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> All Welcome. right. So now it's time to be professional, Marlene. Okay. Yes. Yes, professional. No, appropriate. No. Okay. Yes, yes. Appropriate. Yes. So. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Steve Lambert and Stephen Duncombe presenting their new book, The Art of Activism, Your All-Purpose Guide to Making the Impossible Possible. They will be talking with Marlene Ramirez Cancio, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Steve, Stephen, Marlene, and the team at Or Books. O R Books. Or Books. I've heard both. Or both. O R Or Books for making yeah. this happen, and to all of you in our audience for showing up. Although we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the authors and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by any of our panelists, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Art of Activism, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flappish Ave stores, where you can purchase this book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop the buy link in the chat. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. And I'll put the coupon code in the, in the chat as well. What happens if you put in green light books 15? I don't know. <laughs> then, then, then you get the steak knives. What if you do green light <laughs> <Yes>. books 95? <laughs> you know, and then it'll just be like a grab bag. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Then you'll get someone else's book, actually. Actually. <laughs> If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores and attending events like these, <laughs> buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight, hello interviewer, is Marlene hello. Ramirez Cancio, a Puerto Rican cultural producer, artist, and educator mm -hmm. based in Brooklyn, New York. 
She is the founding director of Emerge NYC, an incubator and network for emerging artists, activists in New York City, heck yeah, and beyond, <laughs> focused on developing the voice and artistic expression of people of color, women, and LGBTQAI plus folks. Marlene will be speaking with our featured authors, the two Steves, Stephen Duncombe and Steve Lambert. Duncombe and Lambert co-founded the Center for Artistic Activism, a nonprofit research and training organization devoted to helping activists create more like artists and artists to strategize more like activists. Over the past decade, they've trained more than a thousand artistic activists across the United States and around the world. Duncombe is a lifelong activist, a professor of media and culture at New York University, and the author of six books and countless articles on the intersection of culture and politics. Lambert is an internationally recognized artist and a professor of new media at Purchase College, the State University of New York's Public Arts College. Their new book, The Art of Activism, is an all-purpose guide to artistic activism, combining the creative power of the arts to move us emotionally with the strategic planning of activism necessary to bring about social change. Steve and Stephen are going to start us off with a reading from the book as well as some visuals from screen sharing, and then they'll be talking with Marlene and with all of you. So please take it away, Steve, Stephen, and Marlene. Thank you, and thank you so much for a wonderful introduction, Kate. Um, we're going to start by just reading a couple of paragraphs. Um, I kind of always hate going to readings and having people actually read. Um, I always so we're going to have the the bulk of this. This is a conversation, which I hope we're going to bring you into the conversation as well. Because um, I know just looking at some of the people that are here, there's a lot of really experienced artistic activists in the crowd out there, and so we kind of want to open this up as fast as possible. But I'm going to start with the first four paragraphs of the book, which begins in um, the Western Balkans nation of North Macedonia, where we've actually done a lot of work over the past years, um, most currently working on campaigns around corruption, working with a very a bunch of very talented artists, activists, and investigative journalists. But it goes something like this. A decade ago, a group of idealistic artists traveled to the countryside of their small Western Balkans nation with a noble objective of bringing art to the people. When they got to one of the towns, however, the people there didn't want to talk about art. They wanted to talk about potholes, big gaping potholes, potholes in the main streets of town that were deep enough to break a car's axle and create a small lake when it rained. Potholes that hadn't been fixed by municipal authorities for years and were symbols of the ineptitude and corruption of the current governing regime. Meetings had been held, politicians confronted and petitions delivered, but the potholes still remained. So instead of bringing arts to the people, the group decided to bring artistry to the people's problems. They borrowed some fishing poles, gathered up some buckets, set up stools around the rain-filled pothole and cast their lines into the lake. Local people came out of their homes and gathered around the anglers. Curious, they looked into the buckets where they saw several fish, bought earlier by the artists at a local market, and they began to laugh, and they told their neighbors. More people arrived, enjoying the absurdity of the spectacle while discussing the problem of the pothole. As the group got bigger, someone contacted the local media, which came and took pictures and recorded the story of the pothole that had not been fixed. The artists shot their own video and uploaded it to YouTube. The story made it to the national media that night and the pothole was fixed by municipal authorities within a couple of days. This is artistic activism. Artistic activism is a hybrid practice that marries the creative force of art to the concrete results of activism. Common definitions of art and activism are often really restrictive. Instead of perpetuating an idea of artists as separate magical beings, Artistic activism allows us to cultivate the creativity we all already have. Even those of us who don't define ourselves as artists have a familiarity and comfort with the creativity, arts and culture that we often don't have with politics. We make playlists of our favorite music, sing songs at church, 
upload videos we've made to YouTube, assemble scrapbooks with our friends, invent new cuisines from our leftovers, and watch TV dramas or read novels before we go to bed. I'm not political is a phrase one hears often, but it's a rare person who doesn't identify with some form of creativity. We are all creative. But most people wouldn't define themselves as activists either. Yet in a sense, we all do forms of activism every day. Organizing a group of people to go to a movie or picking a restaurant, lobbying parents for extra screen time or your boss for a raise, talking a friend out of a bad relationship. All being an activist really entails is having an idea of what needs to be changed and doing something about it. Yet capital A activism can still feel foreign to people and a bit daunting. It seems to take too much commitment, too much risk, and too much time. Oscar Wilde once quipped that the problem with socialism is that it wastes too many evenings on meetings. And that's why mixing arts and activism is so critical, because we all have a creative life. Using arts and culture in activist work actually lowers our barriers to entry. Culture is something familiar, can work as an access point through which organizers can approach and engage people who might be alienated from institutional political systems like voting, lobbying, campaigning, and legislation. To create a new world, we need to imagine what that world looks like. To conjure up this vision takes creativity and time to wonder. Visions of success are what get us up and out in the morning and what attract others to do the hard and necessary work with us. We're talking here about utopia, not as a place to arrive at, but as a point on the horizon to move toward. Art gives us the vision. Activism helps us make the road. So I'll show some uh, uh, pictures of this. This is an illustration of that um, pothole. <laughs> and um, we tried to include a lot of pictures to bring, I guess, like a tone or something that we have in person um, that, you know, this content is still there, but it makes it a little bit more accessible or a little bit more understandable. Um, and what I've heard from people, which I didn't expect, is that the drawings kind of help them remember some of the things in the book. Um, so all of these are done with just two colors. And, you know, these are um, incorporating real photographs of people that did these actions, documentation of the actions. And then there's things in like, well, yeah, that's a good one. Um, later sections where there's, let's see, there's little comics in there, um, big pictures that break things up um, and charts like this that I think help people understand some of the ideas and the concepts that we're talking about in a really like broken down um, way that it is, I don't know, I think helps people retain the, understand and retain the information. Yeah. Um, and there's like an interplay between the text and the drawings too, where um, they kind of like complete a joke sometimes, <laughs> you know? So, um, so I just wanted to give you all a sense of what the inside of it looks like. And um, we can go from there. There's also um, lines that point you to a workbook, right? Because this book doesn't come alone. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, this book came out of years and years of doing workshops. Um, and the idea of doing workshops around the world, um, I think Kay mentioned a thousand, we're probably up to about 5,000 people at this point. Um, that came out of, you know, working with people, not lecturing at them, not saying you should think this and you should think that, but really actually engaging in exercises and practices so we could learn together. And one of the challenges of writing this book, to be honest, was how do you move from this interactive workshop format and medium to really, you know, words on a page. And so the illustrations are one of the things that kind of break it out of that, but the workbook is the other. So there's 50 exercises um, in the workbook, which is free and it's downloadable. You can also buy a hard copy from the publisher um, or you can print it out on your, on your printer. Um, and at various points in the book, we'll ask people actually to do some sort of exercise because that exercise really means that you take the words from the page and put them into practice. Now it is just practice. And in the end, 
The real goal is to get people out in the world actually doing it, but it's taking that step, moving from just thinking to actually doing, and that's really what activism is about. So you, I know you talk about um, that moment of stepping, what is it, off the curb or? Stepping off, off the curb, off, yeah. Uh, stepping off the curb. So, you know, in terms of your, your desire, you know, you've been doing it, you've been, you've been working with people. Why a book? Why, why did you want to do this book? What's your goal in terms of, you know, especially how it has to do with uh, helping people step off the curb or helping us help people step off the curb? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing is just like practical. Um, mm. We have actually, I think, taught in person over a thousand people, you know, maybe 1500 or something, but it took us 12 years. And um, there are folks that we would write to us and say, I really want to attend a workshop. How do I attend a workshop? And they're just in a very real logistical sense was not, there wasn't really a way. And so um, I think it was to, have something for that audience and then also like I have this friend that I went to school with uh, art school with and she, her daughter is a very rebellious kid in Homer Alaska and she's like she's gonna love this book and I was like that's exactly like that's what I want you know <laughs> like a 16 year old that's like angry and then the, but they can channel it and turn it into something that's actually you know might make a difference and um and that this book can help them but Again, you know, accessible to a 16 year old, but also, you know, somebody who's done this for a really long time that there's there's lessons there for them too. Yeah, so it's, I, you just made me think about, you know, so you wanna reach the 16 year old and you wanna reach somebody that is very experienced. Can you run us through, you know, a little bit of the book in terms of who you're trying to reach and how it might reach them? Like yeah. what's in here? Sure, so the, you know, when we thought about doing this book, we really tried mm -hmm. to channel our philosophy that goes into our training, which is, we don't go places and say, hey, here's how to do a flash mob or here's what you should do, okay? Yes. And we don't do that for a very practical reason, which is when you work with artistic activism, you're working with culture as both your medium and as your sort of product. And we all have culture, but we all have different cultures and everything has to be culturally specific. And the real experts are the people we're actually working with. So instead what we do is instead of like, here's how to do this, here's this, you know, is to really back up and talk about concepts, okay? And so if you, the concepts we're really interested in here are things like the creative process, cognition, how does the mind actually work? Culture, what's a way we can think about using culture? Using utopia, for example, um, and uh, history, sort of ideas of what to do with history. And, um, you know, again, it's big picture stuff, knowing that the details are gonna be filled out on the ground, right? Um, so it's really kind of providing basic tools and then what people build with those tools really is up to them. Hmm. The metaphor I always use is like, instead of a recipe, it's a culinary academy, you know? Like it's not a recipe book, it's a culinary academy that we're really trying to, and I, I only realized this today is that I think the, the way I was thinking about it, at least, is like, we're, I want to change the, help the person change, right? And then, the, and then they will be able to, with what they know, be able to, to do something and in whatever context they're in that works, um, as opposed to being like, here's a checklist of all the things you need to do, right? Like how to organize this thing, which is like, you can't avoid that. There's some of that in there. But that um, with the background, with the um, foundation, like you could do anything. And, and you'll think of something that we would never think of that works. Well, that, that part is key. So in our trainings and in the book, in the workbook, um, we end our trainings after about five days with within 24 hours, we have to brainstorm, build, create a creative action together, collaboration. We always know it's worked if we don't quite understand what these people are doing. Like if we don't get the cultural references, we're like, we wouldn't have done it that way. Yeah. Are you um, guys sure? All right. Because that means that it's no longer ours. Um, it's theirs. Right. Um, and I think the highest compliment we've ever had is when people will say things like, yeah, I even forgot that I learned it there. But and then go off to talk about what they did, because that's the whole point. Right. Right. Yeah. 
Um, it's, it's interesting because what big thing that the book also does is to make the case that no effective, just effective uh, activism has worked without the cultural part and without the art part. So the whole section around um, examples that you give of every piece of activism that we might recognize has an entire performative artistic um, component. And you bring up your concept of effect, which I would love for you to explain, to tell us about effect, please. If you I'm glad. I, I just love when I hear people pronounce it like that because <laughs> we got to make up the pronunciation. A effect. A effect. No, it's I, like aesthetic. Effect is... aesthetic. I'm gonna put it in the chat. I'm gonna put it in the chat. It's a e a effect. It's a mi mixture of oh affect and, and effect, right? Correct. Yeah, you gotta get the actual thing though here. Um, yeah. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I was so unprofessional. Okay, go ahead. Yes, so pr pronounce it for me, Mr. Lambert, please. I, it's I effect. You got it right the first time. But um, okay. the idea is that in the research that we did and like looking back when hmm. really early on when Steve and I started working together, it's like, all right, where did this come from? You know, and we went back to like, oh, the, Seattle in the 90s. Like that was that was creative. They were using costumes and stuff. And I'm like, well, actually, and we kept going back further. You know, there was ACT UP. Uh, but before that, there was this. Before, 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 until we got to like Moses and, you know, the all the Abrahamic religions and, uh, and the story of the Buddha. Like all of them have these cultural elements, you know, the... Um, uh, uh, the call to prayer, the Muslim call to prayer, right? Or the and the Quran is like this epic poem that we don't appreciate because it can't read the language, but apparently it's just this brilliant like piece of writing, you know. And so there's all these elements of culture, but they get separated from the history. So it's just like, well, this is this is the civil rights movement. This is a sit-in. That's a tactic. That's what you do. Not knowing that the kind of uh, I mean even. Well, the, the dramaturgy part that went into it, the thinking about how do we create these images? How do we create the photos that will be taken? But also they literally rehearsed them. They like, they thought of it as theater and they rehearsed it with each other. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran is it's not just that it's beautiful poetry, but the poetry was the quintessential art form in the Arabic world at that time. It was it's the IMAX really movie of its day. Yeah, exactly. I was always thinking it would be, you know, hip hop, right? You know, if the right. Prophet Muhammad right now, I'd be like, whoa, 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 you know, because he basically was understanding the uh, popular culture, right? Which is if, mm -hmm. if God is going to speak through me, I've got to speak it to the people in a language that they will understand. So, you know, one of the examples we use is Journal Rappé. Um, and we've gotten to know one of the members of Journal Rappé, KT, very well. Um, and you know, what they did was that they wanted to communicate political news in Senegal to young people. But the problem was anything that sounded political in Senegal to young people was oh, like those corrupt politicians, right? They just tuned out. And so what they did is they like, they were, they were both rappers and they were like, okay, so we're gonna do serious news. And they do serious news. Um, but they wrap it, they wrap it in French and they wrap it in Wolof. And it's again, it's a, that notion of like using popular culture as a way in. Um, so when we talk about artistic activism, we're not talking about necessarily, you know, art paintings and sculptures. In fact, we don't really talk about that. We're really talking as much about popular culture as we are talking about high culture. So uh, please don't rap. Just like this is this goes to the point of like you know you don't teach them what to do. Just no, you know you tried you tried with the Prophet Muhammad. Just that's 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 not that's not that's not your thing. You know. So, okay. So 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 think taking your your own words that when you're like the truth shall set you free and you're like well not really right it's not about information and it's not yeah. about oh, people people know people know the thing. And then boom, they'll, they'll, so I, I'm wondering in terms of your book, you know, if I remember correctly from the evaluations that you do with um, folks who are doing projects, um, what do you want them to think? You, you say, what do you want your audience to think? What do you want your audience to feel? And what do you want your audience to do? 
-hmm. a lot of times uh you know sort of those things get lost you know the 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 affect piece of it and i really would love um for you to talk about that and then also how you hope that the effect of your book you know uh will have people thinking feeling and doing yeah the so the af the effect thing is a the mix of the affective emotional part right mm -hmm. and the effect of the outcome and um, and that those are work best when they're blended together. And there's a lot of ways that you can do it, but that that that's where we got to that word. Um, but the let's see. So the think, feel, do thing is I I, I think that uh, or for what from what we found with working with a lot of people is that they kind of misremember how they changed, right? And they they think like, oh, I read this book, or I you know I saw this lecture. And then I realized, oh, I need to do something. And then I did something, right? Um, but they skip the, um, or they, it's actually not that they did something. It's like, I became a, this person, right? Mm -hmm. Where I, I have this identity where I always will defend this or I'll, I'll um, you know, I'm gonna just show up at these events because I think it's important, but that's not the path, right? Like when you go back and look at it, that there's some reason that they read that book. There's some reason they went to the lecture. There's like this whole history that goes before that as part of who you are. And then it's this long transformation, which again, going back to like, I think that's what we're trying to actually help people with in the, in the book, but, hmm. and that it's not just about getting information and being like, oh my God, this is terrible. Like I should do something that nobody does that, you know, like they get information and then they have an emotional response, which is motivation or more often, if you're just supplying people information, it's overwhelm, right? Like climate, the climate crisis, like, I ah, know what's going on. I don't know what the fuck to do about it, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, you kind of shut down. And so only providing people information actually has this backfire effect that you have to lead them through of like, think through, what do I want them to feel? Do I want them to feel overwhelmed? Cause it, the default is overwhelmed. So I want them to feel inspired, motivated, um, confident, you know? And then what's the action? I want them to do this. I want them to like, what is, what is literally like a physical behavior that you want them to do? Is it calling this person and talking to them about this? Or is it, you know, voting a certain way? Like these are physical actions. And when you can articulate it that way, you're just so much more likely to be successful than like we just, people have to know that this is going on. They need to know the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. I, it, it's interesting too, because there's, there's um, uh, I know that you agree, but you know, we need it all, right? You know, you, you say yeah. there is not one thing that mm -hmm. will do, that is the magic that will, that will fix everything. So one thing about artistic activism too, is that it can act as a cheerleader, especially as you say in your book, when humor is used, right? And laughter for yeah. folks that, you know, their job might be, you know, activism, you know, union organizing, doing things that require research and that is about the information that then is used as part of the research that you uh, talk about in your book, right? So, um, so not to say that artistic activism is the only way or, you know, uh, the only thing we need, uh, but that this book tackles specifically artistic activism. And if you want to know what that is, yeah. then here's, here's that. Um, what, Steve, did you want to say something? No, I was just saying, I think that's super important. And just to, just to underscore that this is not, you don't, we're not proposing that one does artistic activism in the place of, mass mobilization or artistic activism in the place of lobbying or in the place of, you know, very sort of pragmatic political work. Or so, just art, right? Like, yeah, you know, we art. don't talk about this, mm -hmm. but it's not meant to replace yeah. art. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you like producing art that has no political effect, great. Okay. Yeah. Um, however, um, it works best in concert with all those things. And we want people that are doing mass mobilizations, and this was my first activist job was to do mass mobilizations, to think about what was a mass mobilization look like if I thought about it as a performance, mm -hmm. as opposed to just got to get people on the street. What yep. would lobbying be like if I really thought about performative persuasion, as opposed to just going in and saying, well, you got to read this pamphlet, right? And so it's really, it's, it's not just, it's not just 
that we don't want to replace those things, but we want to infuse those very sort of effective strategies with this sort of affective approach. And at the same time, take sort of those affective art and say, okay, well, you say you want to change the world. Now let's actually figure out how to do it. And that might mean actually thinking about how do you marry what you're doing to a mass mobilization? How do you marry what you're doing to actually approaching politicians or something of that nature? So it's really about that hybrid combination, the affect and the effect. It's the word. It's the word. Um, it, it, um, what would you say then in short, you know, I'm just thinking of so many people I've talked to that, uh, that are activists and you know uh, they think of the art part as um you know like a little thing you add on you know you just oh you know, steve why don't you say it let just let steve go off on this one because he just go, asked off. Yeah. <laughs> go off steve go off well i think every artist has had this experience like if if uh many that i've talked to were like people think that you can make something that looks good and they're like hey we've got this whole thing cooked up like could you just like make a poster yes. Exactly. Um, or like you come in and I, I would, I started not to tell people that I was an artist because they'd be like, oh, great, we're going to put you over here, you know, and like you can paint the banner and like, yeah, but why are we doing a banner, you know? So um, the idea is not that art is the decoration, it's that it is incorporated in how you think about the strategy, the objectives, the vision of what the, the world is, and then creatively like figuring out how to move towards that so that yeah you could do have a banner at a march but there are so many other ways there's like in, innumerable other ways yes. and that those are explored and that new things uh, are come up with and and like if you look at modern policing so much innovation so much new like technology stun guns you know um pepper spray um, the tactics, like they have all new, like sound weapons and stuff and all the little goodies. And they're, they're like constantly researching and trying to improve. And the tactics that activists turn to are like, look very much the same that they have for like the last 50 years. And that, so you need to be able to be creative and innovative to keep up, you know, and like, but some people always ask, uh, aren't you worried about this stuff being co-opted by like corporations and stuff? It's like, yeah, that's part of the whole system, you know? Like everyone is always progressing and like, so that means we can't just rest on our laurels and use these things because it worked in 1967, you know? Yes. Um, I had a little, a little like physical reaction to the police thing. Like, I, I don't know that you all want to like take example from the police, <laughs> but I get oh, you are around innovation. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> but, then, but what I would say too, besides the artistic innovation, in terms of having artists at the table from the beginning, in terms of how artists approach the questions themselves, yeah. the topic itself, mm -hmm. it might not be the same as the as the folks that are been thinking about it and doing the research and writing the paper and dealing with you know uh, dealing with the, the problem um so there you know you have that that graph in the book about like the problem as it stands now and where we want to go that quadrants yep. and so like the way we usually go about it and then the like you know different way just make up like trees can talk and you know um and it's so it's 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 uh those kinds of uh thoughts and others actually you know ways that, that that the very problem affects society might be different if you involve artists from the in terms of how you deal with them how you approach them might be different if you have artists at the table right Absolutely. um and then and speaking of the table i did wanna you did mention before steve that uh i love it that i say steve and you don't know who i'm talking to yeah <laughs> uh steve you mentioned before that uh we, the ideal is when you're like i don't understand what these people are doing uh, because it's not in your context. So you, that means, you know, you're, you're talking, I assume, about folks that you've worked with in other countries, mm -hmm. it, from other cultures than yours. And so I'm wondering what, two things, like what you've been able to learn uh, as two white guys from the United States, you know, uh, with a you know, certain privilege uh, from those experiences in terms of your own practice. And then also what have been the things that 
uh, that those folks have been really concretely been able to learn from you. And, and I'm really interested in that exchange. Yeah, sure. And that, you know, it's, it's, I think I'll start with the easy one, which is what we've learned from other folks. Right? <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, our whole pedagogical style is really to go in without the answers, but to go in with tools. And so we're constantly learning how, for example, you know, a big thing for us is like, how do we map the cultural terrain in which we're operating? Well, that completely depends upon the people that are actually living within that world is that they are the experts about that context. And so every place we go, we're actually learning about how, well, what are the signs, symbols, stories, and spectacles that are gonna actually work in that area and work with those folks. Um, but you also ask the question, how has it changed our approach? And I think it's changed our approach and I don't know if you'd agree with this, Steve, but, you know, I think, I don't think we were ever that cocky, but we first went in, we're like, okay, so you got to know this, you got to know that, you got to know that, right? And now we're much more um, question-based, which is sort of like, okay, well, here's the problem. How do we solve this? Okay. Here's setting up the scenario. Here's some tools to think about it. Now, how do you put it together in a different way? right? We're really, really um, suspicious of the sort of one size fits all. Um, here's how to do a tactic. It can work for you. Um, sometimes it can, sometimes it can't, okay? And, you know, a good tactic is going to be based and embedded within whatever its local context is. So we're kind of constantly learning specifics, but also I think trying to tailor our approach so it's much more open to that exchange than, you know, here's the book, read it which by the way, is really hard to do in something like a book. Um, mm -hmm. Because yeah. books were created to give authorial authority That's right. of yeah. an individual who was writing a book, right? Mm -hmm. you know, bourgeois, individualist art forms. And so you really got to kind of, that's why the illustrations are so wonderful because they kind of twist it around and why the workbook is so important and people need to download it because we're working against a medium, which is a really individualist, uh, listen to me, I'm gonna tell you what to do. Well, and the jokes too. It, there was an earlier draft that we had that had a heckler in the book that would like make fun of us and like correct us. And, you know, so that was- Was it, was it me? Was, was it me? Was I? It, kind of was. Was. it was never <laughs> specified. It <laughs> done, Marlette. It just had you write that, all of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But like oh, anyway, the, heckler. the spirit yes. of it made it to the end, you know, of, of, um, but I was going to say, I feel really fortunate to have been able to work in so many different places and meet yeah. so many people um, and, and work on issues that I had no experience with, like, you know, people who people who use drugs, find, trying to find safe places for um, injection drug users and like, they're the best people. Like the people that work on that stuff are the best people, like sex workers, the best people, you know? And so to, to, to just like collaborate with them is so, I wish everyone could do it. But the thing that really surprised me that I learned is that like the emotions of course are the same, right? The pain like is the same, the, the joy, the, the frustration, the like feeling when you succeed, like everyone can relate to that and like, that's the part where you connect. And the other thing is that when you get past the details, like how much in these different parts of the world, what they want is how much of it is in common, you know? Like we think of, oh, you know, the problems in this place are so different, which they are, but like when they're solved and how they describe after, after we win, this is what life would be like. Like it's spooky how in common that is everywhere we have gone what and is kind of encouraging. That, what is that sort of utopia that people want well, to walk toward? So just to back up, we do an exercise, which is called, you know, uh, winning, you know. Uh, imagine winning, yeah. Imagine winning. And because we found that activists get caught up in very sort of, you know, I want to, to achieve this objective. Um, yes. And so we would ask people, okay, so you've achieved that objective, what happens next? And they go, okay, well, we'll implement that. And then, like, okay, it's been implemented. What happens next? And people start getting a little bit nervous. They start getting a little bit because we're afraid to think about what happens if we actually win. So with a little prompting though, 
we get people to think, what's next, what's next, what's next? And then we ask them to describe it to us, that world. And what's really weird is the commonality that Steve's talking about. One, food. There's the smell of food. There's the sound of laughter. And kids. And kids. There's people eating around big tables. And there's just this lush green environment. Yeah. And a sense of like ease. In ease. That's that's exactly. and a world of like leisure, you know. Exactly. One person said this when we worked with this. Um, uh, their Muslim American associations about working on um, the problem of police surveillance. My favorite was he said, "What winning would look like is I would quit being an activist and I would open a fried chicken shack." He was from North Carolina and just sit there drinking Arnold Palmer's and serving people fried chicken all day. And we're like, that is utopia. That is utopia. <laughs> Amazing. Maybe not for so, a vegan, but just substituting yeah. the different foods. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it makes me think too that, you know, in the work that I do too as a process doula, uh, working with folks that are have that have goals, uh, something that keeps getting forgotten when they think about goals is how they have to be. Mm. They forget about the doing. They, it's like, they, it's all about the doing and the doing and the doing. And they forget about the being part. And so it's really interesting to hear, I mean, not, not surprising, there's leisure, there's, you know, they describe the sensorial, where is it in their body? You know, there's ease, right? All that stuff. Um, so I wonder um, if you ever, in terms of affect, you know, if uh, there's ever a, a thought in your workshops or in your lives, you know, in terms of affect and, and ways of being that would e that would generate these um, mm. these feelings that approximate uh, what you've heard so many times uh, having folks describe as utopia. Wow, I'm going to throw that back to you, Marlene. I actually, I actually think that might be Steve and my, our weakness, right? Once we were in Scotland and they got really angry at our, what they called our American productivity. Um, Ooh. Yeah, um, it, is that we were too doing oriented, right? Um, so how do you conjure that up in the work that you do? That sort of well, space and place of being here now with your body and with- Yeah, or, yeah I had a- I had a teacher in art school who uh, named Mike Henderson, who was mm -hmm. um, like worked with the Black Panthers and then and did all this stuff. And then just now he just paints abstract paintings. And I used to tease him. I'd be like, Mike, what the hell? Like, what happened? Why are you making this, you know, plaid patterns? And because um, we have a very good relationship. <laughs> and, yes. um, and he was like, you know, one day I decided that I was just going to live like we want. And I was like, all right, fair enough. I get that, you know? Yeah, totally. So um, in terms of Steve's question about, yeah. about being, um, uh, since, you know, in, in, it's really similar, I would say, because it's not about me, right? It's about them. So it was same as you, you're there to facilitate a process of them reaching some, uh, insight, inspiration, and then, you know, ideas, action, et cetera, the whole thing, the, the creative process. Um, and so part of it is being able to be with them in a way that whatever emotion shows up, are they crying? Mm -hmm. Are they laughing hysterically? Are they, whatever it is, being able to be, to be with and to ask questions, even in the realm of emotions and even in the realm of feelings, you know, in the room. So I know, you know, culturally, you know, that's, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's different. You know, we have our own affects, we have our own ways in which we work and in which we present. And so I'm just wondering, you know, so in terms of looking forward and, you know, workshops, you know, how do we, how do we present? How do we, how do we be? Uh, yeah. Well, one of the things that we're doing, uh, you know, it's actually really Steve and Rebecca are doing at the center is that we're expanding the number of people that do our workshops. So it was Steve right. and me. For years and years and years and years and years right and you know we have our strengths but we also have our limits i mean you know mm -hmm. i've fucking grown up in new england we don't talk about feelings we drink that's right i know <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, yes you know, exactly feelings. So, and so, <laughs> you know, exactly and so one of the things that we've been trying to do is diversify 
the Center for Artistic Activism, understanding that, you know, for all our strength, that there's big sort of areas of which we don't do as well and that other people can. So we just started our first Spanish language uh, workshops, for example, okay? We're not teaching them. Um, uh, you know Mauricio, you know Mauricio from NYU, actually. Anyway. Oh yeah, I do. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's super exciting, right? Because of course those workshops look different. And one of the most exciting things that's happened is when we were working with these folks from the West Balkans in West Africa about training trainers who then are training trainers who then training yes. trainers is that our curriculum comes back to us all weird and wonderful and wacky because they're playing to their own strengths and they're playing to their own needs. Um, so I don't know, watching things mutate, I think is super exciting. There's one other thing I was thinking of, Steve, I'm curious what you think about this. We were in Berlin one time, we were working with trans activists that were like trying to ensure healthcare, fair access to healthcare in Eastern Europe. And um, we planned this whole action with them, you know, at the end of the workshop, it was we do in like this 24 hour period. And it was like this sort of weird trans festival, like they Except very German. It was this very particular German. Oh, yeah, workshop. Thing. Yeah, I forgot how you say the word. Tanschmidt or something. Yes, exactly. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, and so it was like, learn how to juggle and all these weird things. Uh, but juggle, juggle your gender. And, and um, before we went out, someone said, hey, you know, we have to do like a safety briefing because we're going to be a bunch of trans people out in the street in Berlin and like anything could happen. And Steve and I were like, yeah, okay, sure, you know. And so they're like, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. Um, and they had a whole backup plan, but ended up not needing it um, because, and there were, and I, so this is the part of this, there were three drunk guys that had been up all night drinking and they were on their way to the airport the next day at 11 a.m. And when they came, everyone was like, oh shit, this is what we prepared for, right? And those guys had so much fun. And we're so much fun because like everyone there was having fun. And I think that it was like about how they were being, right? And we had the same thing in Macedonia. We had like these LGBT activists had this big event in the park and like everyone was there having a great time because they were embodying the world that they wanted to be in. And, you know, not to say that there isn't a different situation where all that could go wrong, but I think there's a lot to be said about the, the vibe, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. There is. There is. So I know that it's 822. I'm wondering if, uh, Kay, if there are questions that you have fielded or if folks are, um, can think of one now. Yeah, what do you want to know? Yes, hi, Kay. Yeah. We haven't had any questions in our Q&A module, but mm -hmm. I did really love the idea of um, the story you told, Steve, of your friend who was in the Black Panthers and mm -hmm. what is one person's utopia? Yeah. Um, and that was his utopia. And um, thinking of it, even if you're not an activist with a capital A or an artist with a capital A, um, in pursuit of something. I, I think if nothing else in COVID, what I hear over and over again, working in a bookstore, right? People come to the bookstore to seek refuge. And whenever they're like, you know, indulging in them, like, this is so weird, man, when's it gonna be over? It always comes back to the exact thing you both just described of like, sharing a meal, sitting together, like a dinner party. People describe yes. a dinner party yes. and <laughs> live music. And being able to like have a barbecue with their whole everyone they know like it's yeah. this very idyllic like and we'll go back to that as if that's what we were doing before <laughs> right yes <laughs> it's not that yeah, we weren't right. but it was like the in our in our ideal version of our life that's been taken away from us so i think a lot mm -hmm. of people have really been engaging in the what is our utopia, maybe not to the same, you know, abstract extent of like, what if we win, right? Yeah. Which has like a targeted goal, right? That's the, that's the, what is the action? What do you want to motivate that you, you write in your book? Um, so I'm curious if there's anyone out there who, you know, would like to offer what their utopia is, whether it's, you know, <laughs> beyond COVID or if it's just in their own Artist activist work. All right, questions are coming on in. Here it is, people. Goodbye. 
Uh, okay, here's a here's a question. Maybe this has to do with Utopia. Which Steve D book do I read first? <laughs> the, I so, yeah, I can answer this. Yeah, which one? Oh. Dream. Dream. Yeah, I was gonna say dream is is it's about dreaming, and it's about a, it's it's really a plea to the left to start fantasizing and using popular culture as a way to think through some fantasies. Um, it's how Steve and I met, actually. Yeah. We both fantasized about uh, David Hasseldorf. Hasselhoff? Hasselhoff. Hasselhoff. <laughs> I didn't know we shared that. <laughs> so there's another question. Uh, how do you connect with various activist communities? Cross connect through artwork I see so many organizations with similar objectives working in silos. How can art connect them? And I was gonna ask a very similar question about field building. So mm -hmm. yes, connection. Mm -hmm. How about you answer that, Marlon? I mean, that's kind of what you do. Well, how do you, the question is how do you, not that how does one connect? How do you connect and with I'm throwing it organizations back that are in? Well, okay, uh, wow. You see, this is why I would be the heckler. This is great. You know, I'm holding back. Uh, I'm holding back. It's so wonderful. Um, I, I, I believe that the Steves, I'm just going to talk for you, connect through, <laughs> through workshops. That's a big one, right? Is that right? It's not like you go out there like knocking on doors. It's like, hey, yeah. we want to connect with these things. People sort of come to you. There's foundations that connect you with people. There's people that then recommend you to people. So there's a natural word of mouth uh, thing happening. That's not helpful to anybody um, else. Yeah, Marlene, that's what do you do? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, well, like, okay. how, I think, how does one do that? How does how, one how, do that? And how does Marlene um, do it? Well, it's the same type of thing, right? It's like somebody hearing about something, building community in everything you do, building community. So how, you know, how are, how are you, how, how, you know, are as in being you with people that then will make people, hey, you know, this is, this reminds me of, you should really connect with so-and-so. For me, there's been a lot of uh, the importance of relationships. That's really sort of the, the big one relationships is key to all of this. Luckily, there's another question. I have a uh, quick answer, when... which is just, you just show up and give a gift, right? You're like, hey, I think what you guys are doing is great. And I made this thing, this, you know, maybe it's a poster or maybe it's, a, um, you know, uh, I, I would deliver like fully formed, pro or say, hey, I made this project that's about the issue that you're working on. You can use all the photos, whatever. And then they're like, oh, wow, who are you, right? And you're like, uh, you're approaching them with something already. And then th that's easier to start than like, hey, what? how do I fit? What do I do? Um, and Dabney, I actually know that yeah. you're doing a good job at that, so. So we're not as good at the rock. Um, yeah, and also, you know, there's, um, there's a super value in folks that can convene people, you know, who, who have who have the convening power to bring people together, to yeah. to put artists and activists together on purpose, yeah. to you yes. know, because they are in silos, as the other question uh, yeah. said, you know. So how do we break those down purposefully across the field and more intentionally? Um, so then there's another question: When ha when have you seen artistic activism fail? And what did you learn from this? So it's funny you should ask that. <laughs> There's actually a whole section in the book about yeah. artistic activism failing because we've seen it fail many, many times. In fact, we've been part of those failures many, many times. But probably I would say, and Steve might have a different answer to this, that the biggest failure that we see is what we call sort of political expressionism, which is an artist is really upset about something that go out there and they tell the world I'm upset about this, but they don't necessarily think through, well, what do I want this work to do for whom and how? And so it's just their expression. And I, you know, to be cruel, I would say a good amount of political art falls into that category, which is it's art about politics without much thought given to how does it actually work politically. Um, the person's angry, the person's upset, they want to express themselves, but artistic activism goes beyond just expression. It's about expression that then mobilizes other folks 
to actually help resolve and solve the problem. Expression is a part of it for sure, but it's not the end. I would say it fails all the time. It mostly fails. Um, the practice itself is successful, but any individual thing, most of them, most of the stuff I do, you know, that's why I make sketches and drafts because most things don't work. And, um, and that, that, but that is part of the practice is like the, the having things not go the way that you wanted to and learning from it and then building that into the way that you make things so that those failures actually aren't major failures. They're like, they are learning things. And by the time you're presenting it in real life, it's pretty solid, you know? So, um, yeah. I can't, I can't finish, you know, I know we're, we're at time without um, uh, talking about this being a conversation about artistic activism as defined by you all. Um, and that I, I personally wouldn't consider a failure somebody who, who makes art that is expressive, that is, that is doing world building within the community in a way, right? Like I cannot, this is, this is the perpetual, uh, the perpetual loving fight between us, uh, yeah. is that there's a, that there, you, you know, I don't want people out there being like, oh no, I'm failing because art didn't change a particular campaign or a particular institution. I'm just doing political express expressionism, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to, I want to, uh at least end with the we need it all yes. perspective so yes we want you to do your queer you know poetry for three people in that cafe because it makes your uh your existence uh possible and uh you are we're building worlds as you know when you express yourself and live the way you want to live and that is political as well and yes. and there's many many things that are in the realm of expression that also have a um, that also have an effect and that have of course affect and that have an effect that is different from uh, artistic activism's uh, perceived like wins and goals etc but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean they're failures so I just wanted to sort of put it out there uh, before before we before we uh, end sure. we will argue uh, this is why we invited you Marlene <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> this is this has been our, our struggle for years. And Marlene, I mean, thinking about learning from people, um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we, one of the major things we learned from you. Yeah. yeah, we need it all. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that in the book. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, you've done this work for so long and I admire you both so much. And I think that, you know, I've forwarded uh, quotes from your book already to folks, you know, that work both in just art and in just politics. And yeah. so it's it's useful either way. And so I I yearn for for uh, activists that don't get the art piece to to get it more and to yeah. work together. And for the artists that don't, that you know that do want that those those that do state their goals as being to change an institution or to change a policy to then come here and go okay wait how might the, my my work be used in a different way uh, than expression because I have these goals that are like artistic activism goals, so. Yeah, and it, so, yeah. Uh, I would have to say that to every artist, like you can actually change policy, yeah. right? Like I, as an artist, I was told so often that, or, you know, inferred that you, that it was, that was not what artists did. And so uh -huh. to understand that that is within the realm of yes. possibility for artists and even a strength is, I think a big part of what the book is about. Absolutely, agreed. Thank you so much. Well, I see that you, Kay, has returned. Kay has returned. Kay has returned. I believe this is time. <laughs> this is this is fantastic because it's just so clear that y'all could, you know, you know, have have a oh. nice big uh, barbecue block party and continue <laughs> talking about this. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much for the conversation. This is fantastic. Uh, for everyone who attended tonight, thank you for your thoughtful questions, for your comments and participation for listening tonight. And you are able to use the discount code to get 10% on your offer. It's included in the link in the chat. Thank you all. Thank you, Marlene and Stephen and Steve. And thank you, Carrie. Our studios like to reflect the times. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good night, all. You're all invited to the Marlene fan club.
Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes, that's it. I will. Yes, that's it. To all, all of our fan clubs. Thank you so much. It's been fun. And to the people who watch it on YouTube, you know, uh, what are, you know, questions that might be posted there would be interesting to see as well. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. In the future. Yeah. All right. In the future. The future. The future. Bye, future. Bye, all future. Right. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye.